This was quite a weekend, Mike Polydorus, president of Paper Air Media. Paper Airplane Media. Why do I always get that wrong? Because the email is Paper Air Media. And the reason being, I can go into it one day, but uh, Paper Airplane and Paper Airplane Media were taken. We used to be Paper Dash Air. When I first started the company, not knowing anything about anything, hooked up with this internet company because they combined email and everything. So I thought I was saving a few bucks. The biggest shakedown artist ever. They basically at one point turned our email off. Oh no. We had to then change to Paper Air Media. How are you, Polly D? I'm good. I'm good. Polly D's good. Mike, Mikey P, what a weekend. You know, we were talking about this offline, about the fact that the overall weekend will maybe wind up with 75 million, but that is well up from the same weekend a year ago when Spider-Man No Way Home was dominating. I know you had some thoughts here on digital cinema, so I want to tee that up for you. What I want to do is, and we're going to make this one a quick episode, everybody, because we have a highlight for you. We have a special bonus episode. We were going to intertwine it with this episode, but our conversation with Scott Mance. Mike, you weren't supposed to tell anyone. I'm kidding. Scott Movie Mance, our first interview. It was great. So Scott, of course, was covering the Oscars for KTLA. Uh, the morning that the nominations came out, and he had been in Sundance. So we got into a long conversation regarding this year's nominees and talking about what he saw, what he's looking forward to coming out of Sundance. What we thought would be maybe a 15-minute interview became enough for a full episode. So Paul and I decided, though, we did want to go over this weekend. And again, the interesting thing to me was $75 million of box office There were technically no new wide releases in the marketplace, which to me is a very, very healthy sign. Box office was very robust. The other thing I wanted to bring up was, and Paul alluded to it, we were talking over the weekend, and that is what we've seen coming out of the pandemic is when there are these weekends when the major studios do not necessarily have a release, there are what I would call the event cinema alternative content providers who step up fill the gaps and fill the gaps now in a very meaningful way. This was something that, you know, years ago you wouldn't see and now you're seeing it. There were quite a few interesting releases, events that I would say contributed to the box office. The highest per screen average of the weekend, Paul, belonged to? The Thon. The Wandering Earth, part two. Oh, Okay, so here's the thing. We have to make a distinction here. So for films opening and playing in under a thousand theaters, yes, a thon, the Bollywood film had a per theater of 8557. The Wandering Earth 2, as you pointed out, was only in 170 theaters, earned 1.355 million for a per theater of 79.71. Well, we have two movies that were really on anybody's radar coming into the weekend. That's right. Combining for $18,000 of box office this weekend. Who saw that coming? Nobody. And again, this is something that you wouldn't have seen years ago. And at the same time, our friends at Fathom came in and Paul, what did they end up doing this weekend? Well, they had a little movie called Left Behind Rise of the Antichrist. What a title. They wound up at number nine in the estimates at two point. $362 $362 million. That film is up to almost $3 million. And that was number nine. So at number nine, you had Left Behind from Fathom, Wandering Earth, a Chinese-based title that's done tremendous business in China with Chinese Lunar New Year. And then at number 11, just missing out, Mike, on the top 10, but no less important was Trafalgar's Billy Eilish Live at the O2 Extended Cut. That was a Friday night only event. Took in almost $1.3 million in only 596 locations domestically. That to me is one of the big stories of the weekend. The fact that for the longest time, we would have these music events, concerts, whatever it would be. Back in the olden days, you know, they'd have to strike up a 35 millimeter print. They'd get them to the theaters and these things would do like eight bucks in a concert. I remember I'm dating myself now, but I went to the UA North Hollywood and I saw Wings at the Speed of Sound. It was the Wings Over America tour. Oh, yeah. McCartney had a two and a half hour. It was just terrible. I love McCartney, but that was just, I can't even tell you, Paul, how- Of course you love McCartney. This is called Ticket to Ride. Come on. Right. So Trafalgar comes in with 
the Billie Eilish Live at the O2 on Friday night does almost $1.3 million. And to put that in perspective, like they had one or two shows that night. That was it. It was like a seven, somebody squeezed in maybe an eight, but that wasn't across the board. That means that thing was sold out. There were reports of people dancing in the aisles, singing. The energy in the auditoriums was amazing. Trafalgar, nobody is better at these concert movies or concert events than the Trafalgar people. And I want to give a big shout out to them. Yeah, they're great at that. Later this week, on Wednesday, they have a little event. It's the BTS guys. Oh, here we go. Yes. Last year, that thing did $36 million worldwide. Worldwide, right? Almost $7 million domestically alone. Again, a one-night-only thing. That's happening on February 1st. We can expect another huge number out of that event. And then... Fathom this weekend has The Chosen, the first two Chosen events, one that was Christmas of 21, and then there was one over Christmas of 22, combined have grossed almost $30 million. And they now have the season three finale coming up this Friday in theaters only. And again, you're going to be looking at a very impressive number. How this ties in with digital cinema is that 15, 20 years ago, when digital cinema was being rolled out, there were two things that everybody was talking about as they were trying to push this in. And number one was, it's going to be more economical. And I mean, it is, if you think about it. Once the equipment was paid for, the cost was going to come way down. Because think about you know having to make these 35 millimeter prints. Each one is five or six reels. You have to ship into the theater. There was a large, large expense that went there. Now it's a digital file. It can go on hard drive. It can go in most cases electronically via satellite or broadband. It's just more efficient. It's also more efficient to actually create the product, get the product. In some cases, you know, you can have a set of pro tools. You can take a file and you can make it DCP ready. So now what has happened is whether it's Fathom, Falger, whether it's another distributor that is looking to get content in the marketplace, it's much more economical, much easier, and the turnaround is much quicker. So events like BTS, events like Billie Eilish, like The Chosen, can be quickly mastered, turned around, and put into theaters. And the audiences are now at the point where they're accepting that product. They're looking for it. And one other thing I wanted to point out is these events should not be seen as being competitive with more of the traditional content. They're additive because what this is doing is it's bringing people that might not necessarily be looking to come into the movie theater to actually visit. And they might say, this is a great experience. And while I came to watch Billie Eilish, I'm going to come back and I'm going to watch A Man Called Otto or I'm going to go see the Avatar or whatever it is that they happen to see. So everyone needs to understand is on a weekend like we just saw, where there were no new major releases, we had Neon had Infinity Pool, which did almost $3 million in, um, what were they in, Paul? Like 1,800 and something locations, I think? Yeah, 1,835 theaters, 2.725 million for Infinity Pool. And then Dion Taylor, his Hidden Empire group, and Paper Airplane worked on this one, released Fear, in a very guerrilla style marketing, it was fantastic. It was a good group of people. It did well. Almost 1.281 million in 974 locations. Again, catering to an audience that had been underserved. And given the campaign, what was spent, how it was put together, that's a huge win for that movie. But that being said, the advent of digital cinema has allowed all of these films and events to be able to make their way to the local multiplex and take it. And do you think, Mike, that the efficiencies of that really has made that possible? Like you said, the quick turnaround, it's not a big cumbersome thing and they make money. And like you said, audiences are digging it. Well, that's what it comes down to. And what you're starting to see now is, you know, on certain weekends, you're kind of doing a head scratcher going, I didn't see that one coming. I don't know where that event came from. Yeah. You know, it's taken some time. It's taken some conditioning of not only the consumer, but the conditioning of our industry. And when I say the industry, I, I mean the people who program the cinemas and the people who are on the other side, the content providers. You know, when you kind of get a process in place and it's the, this is how we've done it for all the time, it's hard for kind of new systems to break in. I mean, that's not just our industry. That's just life in general. However, the pandemic accelerated a lot of this. We've talked about how it's accelerated the window conversation so that it's not really even a conversation anymore. 
we've talked about how it just accelerated all of the business practices. It's also accelerated the need and the value of these alternative content providers and these alternative studios. So it's great when I see a weekend like that. Well, we actually thought we would just use the Mance episode this week. We thought, well, it'll be a quiet weekend. Well, guess what? There are no quiet weekends, I guess. And to have the Bollywood movie Pathan open at number five domestically is huge. I mean, we've had a lot of opportunities for event cinema, also international cinema, to wind up in the top 10. Here we have this film in the top five. Pathan is another example of what digital cinema is allowing it to do. Not only did it allow the release to turn around quickly, but Paul, that was released with three different language soundtracks, depending on not even where, but in some cases, what auditorium you saw it in. Because, you know, while it's an Indian film, there are different language dialects. So rather than having to have just one language, pick a soundtrack, and this is what we go with, this auditorium might have one, this one might have another one. So again, digital cinema is allowing all of these enhancements, so to speak. Well, I like your spotlight on digital cinema. I really appreciate it, Mike, because you really, you brought that up, and I think that's very important. That was kind of the cornerstone of the weekend was the whole, how digital cinema came into play. And it's such a transparent thing for the audience. They may not know the behind the scenes or how the sausage is made, so to speak, but it certainly played out well this weekend. Well, I mean, look, when digital cinema was being rolled out, I was part of all those negotiations with all the different, as they called them, integrators at the time. And at the time when you looked ahead, the big win at the end seemed so far down the road. And all of these ideas of cost savings, of being able to be more nimble in releases, it all seemed like a pipe dream at the time. And now, you know, 15, 20 years later, it's not a pipe dream. We're actually seeing the results of, of all the hard work that everybody put in. And as you said, the pandemic accelerated some business models. And again, not to minimize the pandemic, but certainly things came out of it that I think needed to happen in terms of the business models. Yes, absolutely. So here, I'm going to move on now in our lightning round, because even though Mike and I said this will be a shorter episode, that remains to be seen. But, you know, once we get going, it's hard to stop. And I want to do a couple of things, Mike. I want to focus on the Oscar bounce. And of course, you tease Scott Mance, who we talked a lot about Oscars too. So I'm going to run down some quick Oscar bounce stats. And then I want to talk a little bit about something we talked about, I believe, over the weekend was the consecutive weeks at number one with Titanic doing that for seven weeks. Very rare. But let's just go through the Oscar spotlight com score and ticket to ride and paper airplane Oscar spotlight brought to you by the Oscars. Here we go, Mike. So A24's Everything Everywhere All at Once had a solid re-release in 1,400 locations. Remember, you can get this at home. Yet it did very well in theaters. The Whale dropped a little bit, but it's in Weekend 8, and it wasn't nominated for Best Picture. Of course, Brendan Fraser rightfully nominated for Best Actor. United Artists, Women Talking. By the way, Everything Everywhere and The Whale are A24 films. UAR's Women Talking enjoyed a weekend-over-weekend uptick of 167%, Mike. That's pretty impressive. Universal's The Fablemans up 73%. Tar, and this is weekend over weekend. So this is post Oscar nominations versus the pre Oscar nominations period. Tar up 138%. And the Banshees of Inna Sharon, which has been available, Mike, on HBO Max for weeks, up 382% this weekend over last weekend. That just tells you the Oscar bounces back over the past couple of years with the disruption of the pandemic. No question that the entire process was thrown into upheaval, as was obviously the box office over the last couple of years. It really seems, Mike, like we're back, like the Oscars are back. We talked about this a lot with Scott Mance, so I don't want to spoil it, but we talked about the importance of having some blockbuster films in the mix. But for these more limited release films that I just mentioned, like Tar and Women Talking and The Fablemans and Banshees, to see this kind of uptick when they're available at home, it's really, I think, impressive. It does my heart proud, Mike, to see that people who could sit at home and watch these movies are like, hey, this is the Oscars. These films were nominated because of how they were presented on that big screen. I want to see these movies the way that was intended by the filmmakers. So that's pretty awesome. 
And the other thing you kind of touched on there and we spoke about it was Scott and he really kind of brought it out and brought it to the forefront. And that was the Academy this year did a great job of creating a spectacle out of the nominations. They went back to what we are. We're in showbiz. We are in, it's the pizzazz, you know, having a live nomination ceremony. In person at 530 in the morning. But it created the buzz and it meant that the nominations now meant something. And, you know, the movie going audience was I want to catch up on these things. Probably the most impressive is Banshees and uh, everything everywhere all at once when you look at that. Amazing. Now we're going to move on, Mike. And I really, I'm going to pick your brain because of your experience, probably working in theaters at this time when movies had legs, so to speak. They didn't open in three or 4,000 locations. Maybe 1,200, 1,300 opening theaters was a huge number of theaters in the early 80s. And Porky's was number one, Mike, for eight consecutive weekends. Fatal Attraction, eight consecutive weekends at number one. Now, the last time a movie had seven consecutive weekends was the first Avatar. And now Avatar The Way of Water, seven weekends at number one. We have to make a distinction, though, Mike, between consecutive weekends and total weekends at number one. Because on Golden Pond, that movie had seven consecutive weekends at number one but only after it expanded in week eight. So seven weekends, the first seven weekends were limited. Then it expanded in weekend eight and enjoyed seven consecutive weekends at number one. But the big daddy, well, there's two kind of at the top of the heap here in terms of consecutive number ones. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. But E.T. everyone points to because it had 16 weekends at number one, which is true, but it had six consecutive weekends at number one. And then it would drop out when a new movie would come into the marketplace. Then it would take over. Then another new movie would push it out of the number one spot. So E.T., you couldn't keep that film down 16 number one weekends overall. Newcomers came and went. E.T. kept pushing him back out of the way. that He kept call, calling home and coming back every, every week. And then uh, Home Alone was an absolute monster, Mike. Guess how many consecutive weekends at number one? I have no idea. 12. 12? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, I'm, I'm going to go back and put my theater hat on. You mentioned one right off the top. And of course, it brought me right back to uh, my movie theater days. And that was Porky's. I was working at the UA Westwood at the time. And Porky's opened up. In those days, you might have a dual track. So Fox had two movies. They had Porky's and they had I Ought to Be in Pictures. I Ought to Be in Pictures was the A track. Porky's was the B track. We were scheduled to get I Ought to Be in Pictures. At the last minute, Fox had a change of mind. I Ought to Be in Pictures went to the Avco. Porky's came to the UA Westwood. I was only the assistant manager at the time. I just remember our manager was just beside himself that how dare they do this? We lost I Ought to Be in Pictures. We've got this Porky's. This is terrible. Well, we must have had Porky's. Now, you said it was number one for seven consecutive weeks, I think. Eight. Eight consecutive weeks. We probably played that movie for 27, 28 weeks in a row. That movie, and people marginalized it. It's a stupid exploitation film, blah, blah, blah. Like you said, I ought to be in pictures. That's, ooh, that's the A picture. And Porky's was just not, I mean, look, it, the cool thing about it was that it was underestimated. But it opened on March 19 of 1982 and played for at least 20 weeks. Went on more than that, actually. It didn't want to leave the theaters, but what an incredible performance. 1982, quite a year. But remember, Porky's, for those listening, opened in 1,148 theaters. Well, that's what I was going to say. Like, it was a different kind of release pattern. So you would open in that 1,100, and the sustainability would happen as more theaters would get added, and the, the advertising campaign would get juiced along the way to support those other theaters. So those that were playing would benefit from the advertising spend. You know, distribution was a little bit different than it is today. Today is the shotgun blast a lot. You know, a movie like Porky's would open up in 3,200 locations. It would get a gazillion dollars. It's whatever it would get in its first couple of weeks. It would then start the slow decline out unless it was something like Avatar or Otto that has those legs. But those movies with legs like we're seeing now 
prior to where we are in the marketplace at this point, you know, they, they were fewer and far between. The quick burns became kind of the advent of the 24 plex, so to speak, because, you know, seating capacity was no longer an issue. Well, you know, Fatal Attraction 1987, that was a movie that, if you recall at the time, became a cultural phenomenon because it was like the a cautionary tale. Like the date crowd was like, oh my God, this movie is out of control. And that movie opened in just 758 theaters, but it played in theaters for 39 weeks. It goes back to just different time, different yeah. release patterns, different ways of going back and releasing your films. You know, that was 30 years ago, 35 years ago. The world has changed when it comes to uh, how these movies get into the marketplace now and ultimately what the goal is. And again, looking back into the early 80s or the mid 80s, Paul, the ancillaries were part of it, but they weren't the driver behind it. And in this case, the ancillaries are now a lot of the driver. I do want to point out, speaking of ancillaries, I want to bring up Puss in Boots. Puss in Boots hit 140 uh, $140 million. They were off basically 9% from last weekend or something like that. It was just a minuscule drop. The movie has been available on PVOD, not on, not on Peacock, but you can buy it in your home for $24.99. And it's been that way since the first week of the year. And I went back and I'm like, how much gross has Puss in Boots actually accumulated since it's been available? Paul, over $60 million. There you go. So I love that. We've discussed this before, but there is a world where the PVOD can live in harmony with the theatrical. You know, you, you can see it. Puss in Boots is not the only film that has had this kind of success, but it just wanted to point out that it's pretty impressive. Well, I'm glad you point out Puss in Boots because it's been out for six weeks. and I think people thought it was gone. You know what I mean? Like it's been out for so long, yet it's right there in the number two spot. It's like the Energizer Puss in Boots. It just keeps playing and playing and it's amazing. So next weekend, it should eclipse the first Puss in Boots, which I think topped out at about 149. So for everyone who looked at this at the beginning and compared it to Sing, I think we talked about this last week and that, you know, it's a little bit of a disappointment. I think you need to put it in context. In the world of Puss in Boots, it's a success. And that's what we're here for, Mike, on Ticket to Ride, right? We're here to put things in perspective. So that was a great semi-lightning round that we had today. I want everyone who's listening to like and subscribe and leave your comments. You can find our podcast wherever records and tapes are sold. We love bringing this to you every week. We talked about the Oscar bounce. We talked about consecutive weeks at number one. We talked about the good old days uh, when films could play for weeks. and we Well, they play for weeks and weeks now, but back then it was different. And uh, also digital cinema, Mike. I like your spotlight on digital cinema. So that's our latest Ticket to Ride episode. I'm Paul DeGarabedian, Senior Media Analyst for Comscore, and you are? Mike Polidoris, President of Paper Air Media. And we'll see you <laughs> next Paper time. Paper Airplane Paper Media. Airplane. So you have me doing Mike, that. you got to get it right, man. It's your company. And, and you have a great team yeah, over there. You know. And uh, Comscore and, and Paper Airplane Media are so happy to bring this podcast to you. So look out for uh, our bonus episode interviewing Scott Movie Man. You see him on KTLA and he's really everywhere. So and what a great guest, our first guest. So look out for that. And we'll see you at the movie. Take care, Paul. All right. Take care.